One of the most important economic blocks in the world is growing. Today, I'm going to be talking about the BRICS. That stands for Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. These are the founding members of the economic bloc of developing countries and emerging markets. It was first formed in 2009 as the BRIC, and then South Africa was added in 2011. And BRICS held its 15th summit this August in Johannesburg, South Africa, and made a very big announcement. The bloc is going to be expanding and adding six new members. These include Argentina, Egypt, Ethiopia, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates. Now, this summit was historic in many ways. It wasn't as explosive and groundbreaking as some people thought it would be, but I still think this is an important historical event. And today I'm going to be talking about what came out of the summit in Johannesburg. In addition to the agreement to expand the bloc into what is likely now going to be referred to as BRICS Plus, the bloc also discussed ways to de-dollarize trade between countries, encouraging the use of local currencies between the different members, and the five original founding members of BRICS all actually have currencies that begin with R, and that's going to be now known as the five R's. So that is Brazil's real, Russia's ruble, India's rupee, China's renminbi, and South Africa's rand. So that is one way to de-dollarize, to encourage trade and investment among the different countries using their local currencies. Furthermore, the BRICS bank, the new development bank, has pledged to de-dollarize gradually over time and is increasing its use of local currencies in financing through giving out loans for development projects using different currencies that are not the dollar. The new development bank, or NDB, is currently led by Brazil's former president, Dilma Rousseff, of the same leftist workers' party of Brazil's current president, Lula da Silva. And she has said that in the short term, the NDB is going to give out 30% of its financing in local currencies of the members of BRICS. And of course, BRICS is going to keep expanding in the future. 42 countries have expressed interest in joining BRICS, according to South Africa's government. 22 countries have formally applied, and it's very likely that these six countries that have been added are just going to be the first of several waves of new members. Now, today I'm going to talk about the implications of the expansion of BRICS, and I also want to review the speeches given by the different leaders of BRICS at the summit. I read through all of the speeches given by the main BRICS leaders and some of the speeches given by other leaders who attended the summit. And I'm going to go through the main points and talk about why I think this is such an important economic and geopolitical development. Now, I think one of the most important things to stress here at the beginning is that this is a massive blow to the petrodollar system. What is that? Well, since the 1970s, the vast majority of the oil sold on the international market has been sold in dollars. Since the 1970s, Saudi Arabia made an agreement with the United States that it would list its oil on the global market in dollars. And then with all of the dollars that Saudi Arabia received from selling that oil, those petrodollars were recycled back into the U.S. banking system, deposited in U.S. commercial banks, and furthermore, the excess dollars were stored in the Saudi central bank in their exchange, their foreign exchange reserves in the form of U.S. treasury bonds. Because central banks, usually they don't just hold cash because over time with inflation, cash loses its value. So instead, they invest that cash in a liquid asset like a treasury bond from the U.S. Treasury. And these treasury securities pay out interest over time so they don't decrease in value. And Saudi Arabia and also the United Arab Emirates and other major oil and gas producers in the Persian Gulf region, they were using that the dollars they received to essentially pay for the U.S. government to finance its spending because they're investing in U.S. debt in the form of U.S. government bonds, 
which are treasury securities. So this has been one of the ways that the United States has been able to finance the massive trade deficit it has with the rest of the world. The US for decades has constantly imported much more than it has exported, maintaining a massive current account deficit. And most countries on earth, if they were to maintain such a significant current account deficit, it would depreciate their currency against the value of the currency they use to pay for imports. But because the US dollar is the global reserve currency and has been since the end of World War II, what that means is that the US dollar does not depreciate in value, despite the fact that the US constantly imports more and more because the US dollar is used to pay for those imports and because so many other countries around the world want to hold on to dollars in, form, in the form of dollar denominated assets in the central bank foreign exchange reserves they hold, but also because many other countries around the world, if they don't produce oil or gas, they need to get access to dollars in order to pay for the import of oil and gas. That maintains an artificial demand all around the world for countries to get access to dollars, which helps strengthen the dollar and therefore it helps strengthen U.S. economic hegemony and geopolitical influence. Now, that system has been gradually changing in the past few years. We've seen some reports that Saudi Arabia is considering pricing its oil in other currencies. The UAE has actually already sold liquefied natural gas to China not using the dollar, but rather using China's currency, the renminbi, and by the way, doing that through a French company, Total Energy. So what we're seeing is a gradual move toward alternatives to the petrodollar, discussions of the petro yuan. Also, Russia is one of the world's largest oil producers, and Russia has been requiring countries to buy its oil or gas in its own currency, the ruble. So now there's discussion of the petro ruble. So this is where BRICS comes in. This could be very important because now that Saudi Arabia and the UAE are joining BRICS as of the 1st of January of 2024, the beginning of next year, this is likely going to be a further incentive for these major oil and gas producers to sell their oil and gas in other currencies, including the Chinese renminbi, also known as the yuan, which is the unit of account of the renminbi. So they're gonna start listing oil and gas in Chinese yuan potentially, or even Russian rubles or other currencies. So this is going to be a massive blow to the petrodollar system that the United States has largely used to maintain significant economic influence around the world since the 1970s. If you look at the list of countries that are the top oil producers in the world, we can now see that BRICS Plus members represent more than 40% of oil production on Earth. This data comes directly from the U.S. Energy Information Administration, so you cannot accuse this data of being biased against the U.S. It's from the U.S. itself. It shows that Saudi Arabia, as of 2022, was the world's second largest oil producer, representing 12% of global production. Russia was the third largest oil producer, representing 11% of global production. China came in as the fifth largest producer at 5% of global production. The UAE is the seventh largest producer at 4% of global production. Brazil is the eighth largest producer at 4% of production. Iran is the ninth largest producer at 4% production. So if you combine those countries together, we're talking about around 40% of global oil production represented by the BRICS plus countries. If you look at gas production, it's a very similar story. The BRICS plus countries now represent roughly one third of global gas production. As of 2021 data, Russia was the world's second biggest gas producer at 17% of global production. Iran was the third biggest gas producer at 6% of global production. Ru China was in fourth place at 5% of global production. Saudi Arabia was in eighth place at 3% of global production. And another country that in the future will likely become a member of the BRICS plus block, Algeria, is the 10th biggest producer at 2.5%. So what we're seeing is that BRICS Plus is becoming a global commodities powerhouse with significant influence in the global oil and gas market. 
Furthermore, when you throw in things like iron ore, which is very important for industrial production, and especially as the world moves toward renewable energy, Brazil is one of the world's top producers of iron ore. Similarly, other countries that are, have expressed interest in joining BRICS, like Bolivia and Argentina, which has been officially invited to join, are significant producers of lithium, which is needed for energy, for renewable energy because of batteries, especially, you know, lithium is used for lithium batteries that are used in electric vehicles, in cameras, in phones, and computers. And Bolivia has also applied to join the BRICS and will likely be added to the BRICS in the future. So what we're seeing is that the BRICS Plus represents a massive economic powerhouse, especially in terms of commodities. Now, one of the ways to see how important BRICS is, is to look at the share of the global economy represented by its members. Because what we now see is that the five original members of BRICS actually represent a larger share of the global economy than even the G7, the group of seven countries representing the imperialist countries that are the colonizers that colonized much of the world. The BRICS countries, even before the expansion, represented 32% of global GDP, that is the size of the global economy, when you measure it at purchasing power parity, PPP, which is the best way to measure GDP. That is larger than the G7 countries, consisting of the US, the UK, Canada, France, Germany, Italy, and Japan, so the Western powers plus Japan. Together, the G7 countries now actually represent slightly under 30% of global GDP measured at PPP. And when you take into account the expansion of BRICS into BRICS Plus, we're now talking about 37% of global GDP. So this is a massive block in the global economy. Furthermore, we're talking about more than 40% of the global population. Now, I should stress at the beginning here that while the expansion of BRICS is very important, there is one country that probably is not going to be part of BRICS. The other five countries that were invited are very likely going to be part of BRICS, but Argentina is likely not going to be able to. Why do I say that? Well, first of all, even before it was announced that Argentina was invited, the, the government actually said that it was not going to become a member of BRICS. Argentina has been dealing with a lot of economic problems, largely due to the unpayable, odious debt that it owes to the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, which is controlled by the U.S., and also to vulture funds on Wall Street like BlackRock. I actually have a separate video about the economic crisis in Argentina. I will link to that in the description below. But the unpayable, odious debt that Argentina owes in U.S. dollars has caused an economic crisis and high rates of inflation over 100 percent. And that has meant that the current government, which has been trying to join BRICS, it's likely going to lose the presidential elections that are coming up in October this year. And there are two other main candidates. The current government is a centrist government of the Peronistas, the Peronists. So it's a wide coalition and it's largely governed by the center of the coalition. And in the upcoming presidential elections, there are two other main candidates. One is from the far right, an extreme far right candidate named Javier Milei. And he has made it very clear that he will not join the BRICS. Milei is basically very similar to the former fascist dictator of Chile, Augusto Pinochet, who is installed in power through a US backed coup, a CIA coup in 1973, Millet basically share, shares the same exact policies. He wants mass privatization of everything. He wants to sell off all state institutions. He wants to privatize healthcare and education. He wants to create private prisons. He wants to militarize the police and militarize the country and basically create just a far right fascistic regime with extreme libertarian economics. He wants to make it legal to sell human organs. And he said he wants to cut off all political relations with China. And when he was asked about BRICS, Millet said very clearly, quote, our geopolitical alignment is with the U.S. and Israel. We are not going to align with communists. In a separate interview, he said that China is uncivilized and barbaric 
And he said that he wants Argentina to only be allied with the so-called civilized West. He's a white supremacist, he's a racist, and he's basically a fascist. I mean, he's he combines ultra libertarian neoliberal economics with fascism. And if he wins, he's going to cut political relations with China and he's not going to join BRICS. And the other main candidate in the elections, who's another very right wing candidate, but not as fascistic and, and extreme as Millet, is Patricia Bullrich. She is from the right wing party of the former multimillionaire oligarch president Mauricio Macri. And she also made it very clear in a speech that she will not join BRICS. And she said that she does wants to break off relations with Russia and support Ukraine and NATO. And she also condemned Iran. She's a very pro-US candidate, basically another US puppet. So two of the main candidates, the right-wing candidate and the far-right fascistic extreme candidate, they want to cut off relations with China and Russia and Iran. They don't want to join BRICS. And by the way, these countries that have been invited to join BRICS, they will not officially join BRICS until the 1st of January 2024. So if the right wing wins the elections in October in Argentina, there's a 0% chance they're going to join BRICS. I mean, even the current centrist government, which is a little more independent, even they have flip flopped on this. They said they were not going to join. Now they're saying that they're going to join. So, I mean, the reason that Argentina was invited to join BRICS is because Brazil's President Lula da Silva demanded it. He said that, that Argentina has to be invited because he wants to increase Latin America's role in BRICS. Right now, excluding Brazil, the only other countries are in Asia and Africa. Well, if you include Russia as part of Eurasia. So now we, we see BRICS expanding and including more and more countries in Eurasia and Africa. Lula really wants to integrate Latin America with other countries in the global south. He wants to create a new currency to challenge the US dollar. And at the BRICS summit, as I'll we'll talk about later, Lula called for creating a new currency to challenge the hegemony of the US dollar to be held in the foreign exchange reserves of the central banks of the BRICS countries and to be used in international trade. So Lula wants to challenge the US dollar. He wants to economically and politically integrate Latin America with other parts of the global south because he recognizes that that's the only way to challenge the hegemony of the United States, which has organized dozens of coups overthrowing democratically elected left wing governments in Latin America, including in Brazil in 2016 and 2018 against the Workers' Party. So he understands the danger of that. He understands the danger of US sanctions and blockades against countries like Venezuela and Nicaragua and Cuba. And Lula has called for Venezuela to also join BRICS plus. So Lula wants to encourage Latin America to integrate more with BRICS. But the reality is that whether or not Argentina joins is really up in the air. And unfortunately, I think it's actually rather unlikely. At the same time, the other five countries that have been invited are almost certainly going to join. So I think we're going to be seeing really 10 countries in BRICS plus in the short term. And in the medium to long term, we're going to see continued expansion of BRICS. Now, on a similar note, I'm not in any way trying to be pessimistic here. I just want to provide a very realistic analysis of the outcome of the BRICS summit. There were some people who thought this would be a major bombshell event and that the BRICS countries would announce that they're creating a new currency to challenge the hegemony of the US dollar. In his speech, which I'll be looking at later, Lula openly called for that. But it's still very much in the planning process. It's going to be a complex process over years. And in the short term, the BRICS countries are going to be encouraging the use of local currencies for international trade and investment. But in the medium to long term, both Brazil and Russia, the Brazilian and Russian governments have confirmed that they have made plans for trying to create a new currency that will not replace the national currencies of each country. So it's not like the euro. This is going to be a currency that is used for international trade. It's really a unit of account that is used for balancing international trade. And that will be also a way that central banks in the BRICS countries can hold that currency in the reserves instead of the US dollar, diversifying their reserves so they're not so dependent on the US dominated financial system. Lula confirmed that in his speech. 
Lula also confirmed that the BRICS has created a working group in order to make plans for that in the future. But that's going to be something that happens in the medium or the long term, not in the short term. As I said, in the short term, there is a focus instead on using local currencies of BRICS members in international trade. But again, I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to be realistic here. BRICS is not going to immediately change everything overnight. We're talking about a process that's going to be over decades. But by expanding, it's, it shows that BRICS is paving the path toward a completely new economic and geopolitical order. And we're still very much in the early stages of that, but it is emerging and it is strengthening. So BRICS Plus has a lot of potential as a massive economic powerhouse, but I really want to stress in particular how this is a challenge to the petrodollar system. And furthermore, by not only adding Saudi Arabia and the UAE, but also Iran, not only is Iran a major oil and gas producer, but furthermore, by adding Iran, the BRICS countries are very clearly sending a message to the United States that they're going to ignore Western sanctions. Now, there has been some criticism of the New Development Bank, the BRICS Bank, for trying to be very careful because of the Western sanctions on Russia. But clearly, by adding Iran, they're sending this message that they are not going to tolerate these illegal unilateral Western sanctions on countries like Iran and Russia. Of course, Russia is now one of the most heavily sanctioned countries on Earth due to the proxy war in Ukraine. But Iran has been consistently under U.S. sanctions, Western sanctions, and particularly from the U.S., since the revolution in 1979 overthrew a U.S.-backed dictator. So th that by adding Iran, this is sending a clear message. And furthermore, by adding Iran and Saudi Arabia, which historically have been rivals in West Asia, the BRICS countries are saying that they're trying to encourage peace and diplomacy. Of course, earlier this year, China brokered a historic peace breakthrough and a thawing of diplomatic relations between Saudi Arabia and Iran. And the United States has been trying to pressure Saudi Arabia to take a very hard line against Iran. And as I recently discussed in a video, the Wall Street Journal revealed that the U.S. government is actually pressuring Saudi Arabia to only sell its oil in dollars trying to negotiate an agreement with Saudi Arabia in which the U.S. will protect Saudi Arabia militarily and help help it to create a nuclear program. And in return, the U.S. is demanding that Saudi Arabia cut some of its ties with China and only sell its oil in dollars. So by adding Iran and the UAE and Saudi Arabia, it very much complicates Washington's efforts to try to divide the Persian Gulf region and have the countries constantly at each other's throats. And furthermore, I should stress that this is a rep representation of the fact that China has been a more important economic partner for these countries for years now. In fact, for a decade, China has been the largest importer of oil and gas from the Persian Gulf region, not the United States, not other Western powers. And China has quickly become the largest trading partners of many of these countries in West Asia. So these countries can see very clearly what direction the economic winds are blowing in in the world. And that explains why they're so interested in becoming part of the extended BRICS plus block. And by the way, when we're talking about the economic importance of the BRICS and global south countries like China, I think it's also important to look at other metrics and not just GDP because GDP is very overrated. It's not a very useful metric. It just shows the size of all of the goods and services produced in an economy in a given year, but it doesn't look at the kinds of goods and services. I mean, so for instance, in the United States, which is a very financialized economy, you know what also is included in GDP? Every time a bank charges overdraft fees, every time People just move money around in investments on Wall Street. They're not actually engaged in productive investment. They're engaged in financial speculation, but that is considered GDP growth. So in reality, you can have your population have lower and lower quality jobs, but with more financialization of the economy, and you can have GDP growth. Technically, the economy is growing, but where is the economy growing? If you look at the United States, production has been declining or stagnant for decades in the industrial sector. 
But China, on the other hand, now represents nearly one third of global production. And so if you look at the BRICS block and look at the percentage of global production and commodities, then we can see that GDP actually understates the importance of BRICS. I'm going to look at an article here briefly from Mick Dunford, who is a great economic geographer. In fact, friends of the show, Radhika Desai and Michael Hudson, on their show here at Geopolitical Economy, they have their show, Geopolitical Economy Hour. They interviewed Mick Dunford to talk about the geopolitical economy of the war in Ukraine. And Mick Dunford published an article at China Daily discussing the importance of the BRICS expansion. Mick points out in this article, quote, GDP is misleading. If one examines the production of manufacturers, energy and raw materials and output, respectively, BRICS is much larger than the G7. So, for instance, BRICS represents 30... This is before the expansion, by the way. Before the expansion, BRICS already represented 37% of the production of manufacturers. It represented 28% of the production of energy and 53% of raw materials and food. If you compare that to the G7 countries, they only represent 36% of global manufacturing, 28% of energy, and 14% of raw materials and food. In this article, Mick Dunford pointed out the importance of the creation of BRICS. Quote, the establishment of BRICS alongside a number of other important new international institutions in the new millennium, and especially after the North Atlantic financial crisis of 2007 to 2009. Important note that actually it was a North Atlantic crisis, largely in the West. Countries like China actually continued growing through the financial crisis. But anyway, the point is that the, the emergence of the BRICS in the wake of the North Atlantic financial crisis was a reflection of the reluctance of Western powers to increase the role of emerging powers in the architecture of global governance, including the Bretton Woods institutions and the World Trade Organization. The need to compensate for the lack of momentum and the unjust conditionalities of existing multilateral institutions, that is like the IMF and the World Bank, which are dominated by the U.S., and furthermore, the need to give an impetus to South-South economic integration and better serve the needs of the Global South. A very important development that took place in 2014 was the establishment of the New Development Bank to mobilize resources for infrastructure and sustainable development projects in BRICS and other emerging and developing countries. The NDB, of course, was created as an alternative to the U.S.-dominated World Bank. And the institution that BRICS created as an alternative to the U.S.-dominated IMF, the International Monetary Fund, was the Contingent Reserve Agreement, which hasn't really been used, the CRA. But the establishment of a contingent reserve arrangement to address the balance of payment difficulties and short-term liquidity problems in a world of volatile liberalized finance and quantitative easing of developing countries' central banks has provided at least an alternative for the Global South. And, and I think the BRICS is now going to try to really revive the CRA. And furthermore, in 2015, the BRICS announced engagement with the Eurasian Economic Union and also the Shanghai Cooperation Organization as part of this process of unifying Eurasia. Mick Dunford also added that another key goal of BRICS is de-dollarization, and he explained that there are three main reasons that countries want to de-dollarize. First of all, the U.S. uses its exorbitant privilege of printing dollars, and that's how the United States can maintain such a massive current account deficit over so many decades. Furthermore, the heavy reliance on the dollar creates an instability deriving from the accumulation of an unsustainable mountain of debt, which is denominated in dollars. And especially at a moment like now when the U.S. Central Bank, the Federal Reserve, is raising interest rates that appreciates the dollar against other currencies where their central banks don't do the same. And that makes it even more difficult for countries whose currencies have depreciated against the dollar to pay off their dollar denominated debt. And finally, another significant reason for de-dollarization 
is that the U.S. is weaponizing its exorbitant privilege of the dollar through the imposition of illegal unilateral sanctions. So those are three important reasons that countries in BRICS and around the global south are seeking de-dollarization to challenge the U.S. exorbitant privilege, to get out of the burden of unsustainable debt that is very hard to pay off, and to prevent the U.S. from being able to attack their economies through the use of economic warfare and sanctions. Now, earlier I mentioned that I read through the transcripts of all of the speeches given by the leaders of the BRICS at this summit in Johannesburg, South Africa. I'm going to start looking at the speech given by China's President Xi Jinping. She emphasized that the goal of the BRICS is to enhance solidarity and cooperation, to overcome risks and challenges, and jointly build a better world. He said, quote, Right now, changes in the world, in our times and in history, are unfolding in ways like never before, bringing human society to a critical juncture. Should we pursue cooperation and integration, or just succumb to division and confrontation? Should we work together to maintain peace and stability, or just sleepwalk into the abyss of a new Cold War? And by the way, this is a, a common talking point that she often repeats in his speeches, he constantly criticizes the threats of a new Cold War. China does not want a new Cold War. It's the United States that wants the new Cold War. And China is constantly warning about the dangers of this. Now, going back to his speech, she said, quote, Should we embrace prosperity, openness, and inclusiveness, or allow hegemonic and bullying acts to throw us into depression? Should we deepen mutual trust through exchanges and mutual learning, or allow hubris and prejudice to blind conscience, the course of history will be shaped by the choices we make. He called for development and win-win cooperation, which is a common concept to be here in Chinese politics, win-win cooperation. He said, what people in various countries long for is definitely not a new Cold War or a small exclusive bloc so once again, we see Beijing condemning Washington's attempt to start a new Cold War. And he also once again calls for common prosperity, which is another concept along with win-win cooperation that China constantly promotes. Now, I think probably the most scathing section in this speech is the following. President Xi says, we need to promote development and prosperity for all. Many emerging markets in developing countries have come to what they are today after shaking off the yoke of colonialism. We succeeded in gaining independence and have been exploring development paths suited to our national conditions. Everything we do is to deliver better lives to our people. However, but some country, he says, and clearly when, sa when she says some country, he's referring to the United States. So she says, but some country is obsessed with maintaining its hegemony and has gone out of its way to cripple the emerging markets and developing countries. Whoever is developing fast becomes its target of containment. Whoever is catching up becomes its target of obstruction. So he's saying that the United States constantly tries to contain and obstruct the development of countries in the global south to prevent them from developing and challenging the U.S.'s economic hegemony. However, the Chinese president, Xi, says, this is futile. Blowing out others' lamp will not bring light to oneself. So the U.S. will not make itself prosperous by attacking other countries' economies and trying to prevent them from developing. Now, in his speech, she also calls for universal security. And once again, he condemns this new Cold War mentality. And he, in particular, he condemns the U.S.'s strategy to portray the conflict in the world as one between so-called democracy versus authoritarianism. She warns this will lead to a clash of civilizations, which is not what he wants. Instead, he wants to deepen solidarity and cooperation with other emerging markets and developing countries. He wants to promote global multipolarity. That's a very important term. It's going to come back. So the BRICS wants to promote global multipolarity and greater democracy, international relations, 
and help make the international order more just and equitable. And she pointed out that more than 50 countries participated in the BRIC summit in South Africa. And finally, he repeated that China does not want to engage in ma major power competition. That's the word that the U.S. constantly uses to refer to its new Cold War with China and Russia. Beijing has said very clearly they do not want major power competition. They do not want a new Cold War. Now, I, after looking at Xi's speech, I want to look at Putin's speech here. Russian President Putin stressed that BRICS has been following a forward-looking strategic course which meets the aspirations of a significant portion of the international community, the global majority. This is an important concept that Russia has been promoting, emphasizing that they are part of the global majority. Only 13% of the world population lives in the so-called West. 87% lives outside the West. They're the global majority. And on many issues, they're in agreement. It's the Western imperialist powers, the neo-colonial powers that are trying to control the entire global economy, con exploit the natural resources and labor all around the world, extracting the surplus value of workers around the world, the wealth produced of countries around the world. And they do not represent the global majority. So that's an interesting phrase that Putin has been using here. He also stressed that in BRICS, quote, we are all united in our commitment to shaping a multipolar world order. So that's also a word that she used and other leaders used. So this is a very popular word at BRICS. We're in a multipolar world. And that's a world with genuine justice based on the international law. So not the Western so-called rules-based international order in which the U.S. makes the rules and orders everyone around. So based on international law, in keeping with the key principles set forth in the UN Charter, so with its base in the United Nations, including sovereignty and respecting the right of every nation to follow its own development model. So countries are allowed to have socialist development models like China, like Cuba, like Venezuela and Nicaragua and Bolivia and the DPRK and Laos and Vietnam. The U.S. should stop imposing sanctions on them and attacking them. That's what he's saying here. Despite the fact that the Russian government is no longer socialist, it respects the fact that other countries have their own development models. Putin also says, quote, we oppose hegemonies of any kind and the exceptional status that some countries aspire to. So that's calling out the United States, which claims to be the exceptional best country ever in human history. It's a very common thing to hear in the U.S., which is just like a pathological thing you hear from politicians of all stripes. And Putin also says that he opposes the new policy this hegemony entails, which is a policy of neo-colonialism. So Putin is condemning neo-colonialism. Now, some people, the Western powers would say this is hypocritical because of the war in Ukraine, but Putin points out Quote, it was the attempts by some countries to preserve their global hegemony that paved way to the deep crisis in Ukraine. It started when an anti-constitutional government coup took place in Ukraine with the help of the Western countries. This was followed by the unleashing of a war against people who refused to accept the coup. And I recently published a video, which I'll link to in the description below, looking at a recent poll which found that actually a majority of people in Germany and France recognize that the war in Ukraine was caused by the United States, Ukraine, and NATO through this coup in 2014, which set off the war that the West has fueled, which is, which is a proxy war between NATO and Russia. So in his speech, Putin is pointing that out as well. Continuing in his speech, Putin stressed that the, that the BRICS countries have a population of more than 3 billion people, which is more than 40%, nearly one half of the global population. And the BRICS countries, as I mentioned earlier, now have a greater share in global GDP than the so-called group of seven in terms of purchasing power parity. Over the past decade, BRICS countries have doubled their investment in the global economy and the total exports of BRICS countries represent 20% of the global total. 
Putin stressed that the BRICS countries need to integrate economically more for diversification of supply chains, de-dollarization, an important talking point that, that was a very hot topic at the BRICS summit, de-dollarization and the transition to national currencies in mutual transactions, digital economy, and fair technology transfer. So helping to provide technology for developing countries. He also called for the creation of new sustainable and safe transport routes, including the accelerated development of transcontinental routes, such as the North-South Corridor, which is a reference to the INSTC, the International North-South Transport Corridor, which is going to economically integrate India going through Iran and up through the Caspian Sea into Russia. And that is a way of integrating Eurasia by excluding the Western powers, which want everyone to simply to trade only with them. And Putin said that the BRICS should establish a permanent transport commission to better physically integrate these countries, which, of course, will facilitate economic integration. So Putin's speech really emphasized the economic potential of BRICS. In his speech, Brazil's President Lula emphasized how BRICS can play a very important role, giving a voice to the global South on the international stage. I translated some of the main points from the Spanish version. Lula stressed that the BRICS participation in the global economy is growing. It is now larger than the G7, representing 32% of global GDP. He also emphasized that developing countries are growing economically much faster than the rich capitalist countries in the West. Lula said, this shows that the dynamism of the economy is in the global South and BRICS is its moving force. He said, Brazil wants to integrate more with other countries in the global South in order to create high quality jobs, combat poverty, and increase the incomes of Brazilian families. He said he wants to modernize our infrastructure with more investments in roads, in ports, and in airports, and in energy infrastructure, including renewable energy. And then here, in what I think is one of the most important parts of his speech, Lula said that he has defended the idea of adopting a unit of account now, it's interesting. He didn't say currency, which would be moneda. He said unit of account, unidad de cuenta. And then he clarified that this would not substitute our national currencies. So here, Lula is saying very clearly, this is not the EU model. It's not the euro. This is the model that is similar to what was famously proposed by the economist John Maynard Keynes at the Bretton Woods Conference in 1944 as an alternative to the dollar which was made the global reserve currency. Instead, he proposed an international unit of account called the Bancor, which no single country would control, like the dollar, and it would be backed by a basket of currencies and commodities. So that's what Lula is calling for here, an international unit of account, not only for international trade, but also to be used in reserves and investment. Lula said, the unsatisfied needs for financing in developing countries continues to be very high. The lack of significant reforms of the traditional financial institutions, that is largely the IMF and the World Bank, Lula said that the lack of reforms of these institutions limits the volume and modalities of credit of banks that are already existing. So that's why the, the new development bank of the, the BRICS bank was created. Lula called for strengthening the New Development Bank, and he said, by diversifying sources of pay in local currencies, expanding the network of partners, and growing its members, the NDB constitutes a strategic platform to promote development between emerging countries. He also called for the NDB to collaborate with the African Development Bank, and other development banks in other parts of the global south. Lula said that this is a multilateral plan and that BRICS can be a force to create more fair, equitable trade in the world. And also in the speech at the BRICS summit, Lula talked about the importance of 
transition away from fossil fuels and new green technology. But he was very clear in his speech. I'm quoting from his speech directly. We cannot accept a green neocolonialism that imposes trade barriers and discriminatory measures under the pretext of protecting the environment. So Lula made it clear that yes, climate change is a real threat. We need to have transition toward green technology, but he condemned green neocolonialism. Once again, repeating that term that Putin also used in his speech at the BRICS summit. So Lula is really coming out here and saying that the Western powers are engaged in a form of neocolonialism and we cannot allow that. Now, another very important point in Lula's speech was he stressed that Africa is the future of the world as a continent that is rapidly growing in terms of its economy and its population. And he stressed that that in Latin America, in Brazil and the, and the region as a whole, that they are really trying to increase their relations economically and politically with Africa. He points out that when in his first two terms as president, he's now in his third, Lula took 12 trips to Africa and he has been in 21 African countries and he is promoting development between and cooperation between Africa and Latin America. Lula said in his speech, quote, like South America, the African continent has important reserves of critical minerals like lithium and cobalt, which will play an, a strategic role. Then Lula emphasized, this is a key point that was also echoed by South Africa's president, Cyril Maposa. Lula said, quote, to not remain as mere exporters of primary products, that is of raw materials, we should take advantage of the integration of our supply chains and add value to the goods and services that we produce in a sustainable way. This is a really crucial point that we saw from Lula and Ramaphosa and other leaders at the BRICS summit saying that these countries don't want to simply export raw materials to the rich capitalist countries, the imperialist countries. They want to develop their own industries so they can process their iron ore, so they can process their lithium, so they can process their other minerals and create those products in their own countries and also provide high quality, good industrial jobs for their people. Lula concluded his speech stressing that BRICS has a unique opportunity to shape the trajectory of global development. And he stressed once again, our countries together represent one third of the global economy. So BRICS has a lot of economic potential. Now, I also want to look at the speech given by South Africa's president, Samara Maposa. This was a very interesting speech because it has another thread of anti-colonialism like the speech given by Lula and by Putin. And in his speech that Ramaphosa gave, he compared the BRICS to the Bandung Conference in 1955, which helped to give birth to the non-aligned movement. So once again, we're seeing the resurgence of third world nationalism, of countries in the global south that were colonized, that are telling the former, that are telling the colonial powers in the west, we want to be truly independent. And that means we also have to have economic independence. So the South African president said at the BRICS summit, quote, when reflecting on the purpose and role of BRICS in the world today, we recall the Bandung Conference of 1955, where Asian and African nations demanded a greater voice for developing countries in world affairs. The conference called for the recognition of the equality of all nations, large and small. We still share that common vision of a fair and just world. Then Ramaphosa made comments similar to Lula about the importance of resource nationalism. Yes, Africa is a continent very rich in natural resources, and the countries on the continent should use those natural resources to benefit the development of their own economies. Ramaphosa said, quote, as the African continent, we are determined that the continent's substantial resources are harnessed for the benefit of the, and the development of Africa's people. He said the BRICS bank, the new development bank, can play an important role in this. He said, quote, the bank is playing a leading role in efforts to increase the resilience of the global south and to bring fairness to global trading and financial systems 
by strengthening the use of BRICS currency. So once again, we see all of these leaders stressing the importance of de-dollarization. Ramaphosa said, quote, we have to reform global economic, financial, and political governance, including the multilateral trading system, so that we create a conducive environment for fair trade. No, he didn't talk about free trade, fair trade. None of the neoliberal capitalist Western dogma. He also added, quote, while many countries of the global South are seeing significant progress in industrialization, technological development, innovation, and digital economy, they are not fully reaping the economic benefits. And then he stressed the importance of countries using their natural resources to develop their own industry. In fact, I'm going to play a clip of another speech that Ramaphosa gave at the summit where he summarizes this point very well. Africa is a continent of great opportunity in industrialization process in a variety of sectors. This continent is rich in the critical minerals that will drive business success in the 21st century. The continent has resources of lithium, vanadium, cobalt, platinum, palladium, nickel, copper, rare earth minerals, rhodium, and many others. And these are the minerals that are bound and are driving economic activity across the world. African countries have made it clear that the investors of choice are those who will come and invest in our continent, but also process the resources here close to source so that African countries do not export rock and sand but export finished products as we would like to do. So what we're really seeing here is the reemergence of economic nationalism in the global south. This was destroyed largely by the United States in the first Cold War where the CIA organized coups constantly against nationalist and also leftist and socialist leaders in the global south. Any country that wanted to use their natural resources to benefit their own country, they wanted to develop their own industry, instead of simply being resource extraction hubs to export cheap raw materials to the imperialist countries in the core of the, of the capitalist world system. We also see this kind of resource nationalism emerging in countries like Indonesia, which has taken policies to develop its own local industries and prevent the extraction and export of raw materials to the rich imperialist countries. And Indonesia is a country that has applied to join BRICS and is very likely going to be another future member of BRICS+. Plus. So what we're seeing is a resurgence of the spirit of Bandung and the non-aligned movement and third world nationalism. We see that reflected in the speeches given not only by the BRICS country leaders, but also, for instance, by Venezuela's president, Nicolas Maduro, who also, even though Venezuela is not yet officially invited to be part of the BRICS, it has applied to join the BRICS, and it was invited to attend the summit. And at the summit, President Maduro gave a speech. There is no English language transcript of Maduro's speech, but there is a Spanish language transcript on the Venezuelan government's website, and I'm going to translate a few clips here. Maduro said, quote, Today we are convinced that that new world order is already a reality and the BRICS is playing a fundamental role in the dynamic geopolitics that has generated the trust between peoples and governments of Latin America, the Caribbean, Africa, and Asia with this model of development and values of mutual respect. Maduro stressed that BRICS is helping to create, quote, a new global system that is truly free, inclusive, fair, and in solidarity, where the principles of international law are restored, threatened by the old imperial hegemonic system. So he's saying that BRICS is helping to create this new world order that is multipolar and is replacing the imperialist system dominated by the United States and the colonial powers in the West. Another country that is not yet part of BRICS, but was invited to participate was Cuba. 
And Cuba's president, Miguel Díaz-Canel, also spoke and stressed the importance of BRICS in helping to give birth to this new multipolar order. Díaz-Canel also had a one-on-one -on -one meeting at the BRICS summit with China's president, Xi Jinping, and the Chinese state media published a note, a diplomatic note, that said very clearly, quote, Chinese President Xi Jinping said that China will continue to firmly support Cuba in defending national sovereignty and opposing external interference and blockade. So this is a clear example of China condemning the illegal U.S. blockade on Cuba, which is over 60 years old, which has devastated the country's economy. And we see once again that China is standing up to U.S. hegemony and bullying and the unipolar order that the United States has tried to impose on the world. So those are the main points I wanted to discuss today in this analysis of the BRIC summit, the 15th BRIC summit in Johannesburg, South Africa. It was historic in a lot of ways. We see BRICS expanding into BRICS Plus, and we see discussions of de-dollarization, plans for using local currencies, uh, discussions of making plans for in the future, creating a new unit of account, a currency, to challenge the hegemony of the US dollar, although that's not going to happen in the short term. So, I mean, we shouldn't overstate the extreme significance. There are people who say that this is the end of U.S. hegemony. This is the end of the dollar's hegemony. We're seeing a gradual process. Like I said earlier, I think what we're seeing here is steps toward the creation of this new global geopolitical and economic order. And it's not fully fleshed out yet. It's still being developed. But we are firmly in a multipolar world. The unipolar system that the United States and the Western imperial powers have tried to, to revive and to impose on the world is not going to come back. And the fact that BRICS is expanding, the fact that there are so many countries, 42 countries uh, around the world that have expressed interest in joining, according to South Africa, 22 that have formally applied, shows that, that the global majority, as Russia has termed it, the, the global South, which represents the global majority, the 87% of the global population outside of the West, is not supportive of the Western hegemonic order that Washington and Brussels are trying to save. There are contradictions in the BRICS. There are conflicts, for instance, between China and India, as I've discussed. And there are, as I dis discussed, conflicts with Argentina, which is probably not going to become part of BRICS, honestly. We'll see what happens in the October elections, but the far-right presidential candidate Javier Milei and the right-wing candidate Patricia Bullrich, uh, both of them have said that they will not join BRICS and they want to cut their ties with China and Russia. So there are internal contradictions, there are complications, but overall BRICS continues to grow, it continues to gain political and economic influence, and the Western hegemonic control over the world is declining. That's what's important because it provides more space for countries to pursue alternative paths of economic development that are actually in the interests of working people and not only in the interests of billionaire capitalist oligarchs, which is what the neoliberal financialized capitalist economies in the West, that's what their goals are. Their, their goal fundamentally is to serve the interests of a small handful of capitalist oligarchs that control the political systems that buy off politicians. So with that said, there's so much more I could say, but this has already been long enough. Please subscribe on whatever platform you're watching or listening on. All of these videos are also available in podcast form. If you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe and like the video. It helps to support our material in the algorithm. It helps to promote it. And if you're also on a podcasting platform, please subscribe. And if you want to support the work that we do here, please, you can donate. We rely entirely on small donations. Please consider going to geopoliticaleconomy.com slash support. There are several ways you can support us. The best way is you can go to patreon.com slash geopoliticaleconomy. And we do not have any institutional support. We do not have any big donors. We rely entirely on small donations from listeners and viewers like you. I want to thank everyone for joining me for in this very long episode today. I will be back very soon 
with more original reporting and analysis of geopolitics and economics. Thanks a lot.